Thank you very much. Welcome to Community Whole Planning Public Meeting, Wednesday, June 7, 2023. And I'm going to go for confirmation of the agenda. I'm going to look to the deputy clerk to identify any items to add or delete to the agenda, please. Thank you, Your Worship. There are no items to add or delete. Thank you. We have a recommendation that the agenda for the Committee of the Whole Planning Public Meeting of June 7, 2023 be confirmed to circulate. I look for Councillor Masters to move and Councillor Jax to second. Thank you very much. All those in favor, and that's carried. Thank you. Disclosure of pecuniary interest. If anybody has a disclosure of pecuniary interest, if you could identify now. If something does come up during the discussion, raise your hand. I'll call upon you immediately, and you can declare then. Thank you. So going into the agenda, the item we have tonight is a proposed town-initiated zoning bylaw amendment. It's housekeeping. It's file number DEV430, public meeting report. The purpose of this report is to provide council and the public with background information regarding the proposed zone, town-initiated zoning bylaw amendment, housekeeping, to address items to assist with the implementation of the recently approved comprehensive zoning bylaw. So I'm going to look to the clerk. Can you give me confirmation of the notice, please? Thank you, through your worship. Um, in accordance with the uh, requirements in the Planning Act, a notice of complete application and public meeting application was provided by publishing a notice in the newspaper, which ran on May 18th, 2023. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to go to our town staff, Madeline Gibson. Madeline, you have a small presentation, please, to present tonight. I do, and I thank will keep you it very small. much. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, my name is Madeline Gibson. I'm a senior planner here with the Town of New Tecumseh, and I will give you a brief description of the proposed town initiated housekeeping zoning bylaw amendment. So, a little bit of background Council approved the current zoning bylaw back in September 2021. Since its approval, staff noted that there are some uh, items that require further attention. This includes formatting, grammar, and opportunities to increase flexibility, clarity, and reduce conflict for implementation purposes. On May 30th, 2022, staff brought forward a report to council requesting the initiation of the town and requesting the initiation of a town initiated zoning bylaw amendment housekeeping. And it's something that staff continue to do to be sure that our zoning bylaw operates at uh, its maximum efficiency. And the intention of these housekeeping amendments are to ensure greater ability to implement, enforce, and support new to comes with residents and businesses. So tonight we'll discuss the proposed amendments. It includes three new provisions, one additional use, uh, five edited provisions, and four new edited definitions. And I will go through them quickly. They were included in the report in great detail, um, but uh, for time's sake, we'll just run over and we can always revisit some of the slides if we'd like to. So for new provision, the first new provision would be the parking of commercial motor vehicles in the agricultural areas. Our previous zoning bylaw did speak to this, but it was removed to increase flexibility. So currently we don't have any provisions that speak to the parking of commercial motor vehicles in agricultural areas. Since the adoption of our new bylaw, this has created a lot of ambiguity um, and it's generated some bylaw complaints and it's difficult for us to enforce whether um, people are either starting a business or they're just you know parking their personal commercial motor vehicles um, and there needs to be a little bit more direction so we've proposed to add in some direction it's similar to what we had in our older bylaw but um, it is more flexible and just requires that there be a bit of a buffer between um, residential uses and the commercial motor vehicle parking the next would be adding boarding house general regulations. So again, uh, our current zoning bylaw does not have any general regulations that deal with boarding houses. Boarding houses are permitted uses in our residential zones. Uh, by adding these general regulations, it does allow us to either enforce um, the boarding house regulations on either illegal boarding houses that we get through bylaw complaints, but it also sets us up for success by supporting these types of residential uses as important housing options. Um, they are straightforward. They're not, um, in our opinion, they're not um, too difficult to meet. It's really just to minimize compatibility issues that might be arising from the establishment of this use in a mature existing residential neighborhood. 
The next would be municipal servicing general regulations. Uh, I know that uh, the town has been dealing with uh, servicing allocation policy. Currently in our zoning bylaw, we don't have any zone provisions that deal with the requirement for existing adequate and appropriate services being available uh, at the property limits for development. And we know obviously with changes in Bill 23, there are certain developments where we can no longer require things like site plan control. Um, many zoning bylaws in other municipalities do contain similar provisions. This provision is basically saying, you know, we want to be sure that we've got adequate capacity, uh, it's appropriate, and it's there uh, to ensure your development can go forward rather than leaving that sort of vague intention that, you know, services can come, but we don't know when that might be or we don't know when the developer is going to move forward with their development. So this provides us a little bit more control. This provision here was adopted from the City of Guelph, um, and I know it's been very successful for them. And then for adding of uses, so we have one additional use, and that's the use of a duplex. Currently, um, our zoning bylaw does not allow a duplex as a residential use in our residential zones. Um, we do allow single detached dwellings, semi-detached, triplex, quadplex, and, and several other uses. Uh, so this may have just been a miss when we adopted our, our, pre our new zoning bylaw. So adding duplex just helps us again support more housing options uh, and helps uh, get these housing options sort of up and going quicker. So what we're proposing here is that the duplex be zoned uh, very similarly to a single detached dwelling uh, because of the built form typically is the same. Um, and then we would also require one parking per unit, uh, which is very similar to what we require for other residential built forms. Um, and then of course we would add a definition for duplex to be sure that we are um, getting that right built form and that it is appropriate. So for edited provisions, uh, the first would be the existence of an angular plane in our employment area two. So this was included in our new zoning bylaw amendment. However, in practicality on the ground, the application of an angular plane generally in our employment area two as a sort of a wide reaching provision is not um, appropriate, I guess, or conducive to industrial development within our employment area two. Uh, mainly because this is a, a large swath of zone um, and there are many properties that are not next to sensitive uses um, so that application of angular planes seems to be overly prescriptive so what we've done instead is we've removed that requirement for angular plane that was uh, broadly applied to the zone and what we've done is we've specified that it's only applicable if it's next to a sensitive use so like a school or a residential that sort of thing where we we think that's more appropriate to apply that. We don't want to be punitive on new businesses that are looking to establish in our industrial area. For edited provision, um, we are adding in the ability to have additional residential units attached uh, in our Oak Ridge's Moraine Countryside Rural Zone and Countryside Agricultural Zone. So currently in our zoning bylaw right now, we have two types of additional residential units, or you may be more familiar with the accessory residential units, the terms are the same. We have one that's attached, which is something that you would find in an existing primary dwelling, and then of course we have one that's permitted as detached in an accessory building. So in keeping with the Oak Ridge's Moraine Conservation Plan provincial policies, uh, we are able to permit those additional residential units, but only the attached kind where it's in within the existing uh, primary dwelling. So again, this is just gonna provide some more housing options. We know that there are other, other Oak Ridge's Moraine zones that exist, but the provincial policies don't support the um, increased density of residential in those zones. So it'll only be in these two zones. So our third added provision would be the parking of commercial motor, motor vehicles in residential zones. So the parking of commercial motor vehicles in residential zones as it is today, uh, the provisions are something that we've had in our bylaw and have not changed for a number of years. Um, we have received uh, both feedback uh, from those who own commercial motor vehicles uh, who would like to park them in their, at their homes and then also we have received bylaw complaints um, against commercial motor vehicles. So it's a real balance that we're trying to play here. Um, 
previously, so sorry, currently our provision does speak to weight of a commercial motor vehicle in the residential zone, which is really difficult for us to enforce. Uh, it's difficult for bylaw to enforce as well, particularly because a lot of people own um, pickup trucks that are larger in size for their own personal vehicles. Um, and then some can e easily adapt them to be a commercial motor vehicle as defined in our bylaw. So what we did is we took a look at a number of municipalities and what their approaches are, both small municipalities and larger municipalities, just knowing that we're somewhere in the middle and we are growing. So there is a balance of needs and compatibility issues there we need to look for. So right now we have proposed a slight change in our provisions. We've taken out the weight component because that was just far too difficult for us to enforce and it left a lot of gray area uh, and a lot of questions. And we have limited to the size of the vehicle. And then of course we've identified certain commercial motor vehicles that just generally are not appropriate. So like construction vehicles, that sort of thing. Uh, and we've tried to keep in mind that balance between people who are living in the residential area and not expecting those types of vehicles and those people who are required to bring those vehicles home and use them as their personal vehicle as well. So our fourth edited provision would be permitting single detached dwellings in our environmental protection zone. So under our new current uh, zoning bylaw amendment, we do not allow any new development in our environmental protection zones. We have run into issues since the implementation of that zoning bylaw because we do have some lots of record that do not contain any dwelling units, but of course those individuals do have property rights uh, and development rights. So we have spoken to Jay, who's the town solicitor, uh, on on a couple of different specific instances where this has come into play. And what we've done is we have acknowledged that there are those property development rights there, but we wanna be sure that those features are not impacted negatively, the environmental features. So we've applied the same, um, I would say restrictive in a way, uh, policies that we apply to the Oak Ridges Moraine environmental protection when you wanna develop within 90 meters of that, which basically says, this is a permitted use. Yes, you could build a single detached dwelling, but you need to demonstrate to us first that there's not gonna be any implica implications to the environmental feature. This only applies to single detached dwellings. It does not apply to accessory buildings. So accessory buildings are still not a permitted use. They would have to go through some sort of planning act application to ask for that relief. The fifth edited provision would be uh, the additional general regulations for additional residential units, or you may know them as accessory residential units. This has been brought in just based on provincial direction, uh, where there's a lot of confusion on the mixture of accessory residential units that are permitted per property. So we've sort of laid it out that here are your four scenarios, and it's either scenario, it's not an and situation. So you can have one additional accessory dwelling unit attached in the primary building, or you could have one additional dwelling unit detached in addition to the primary dwelling, or you can have one additional dwelling unit attached and one accessory dwelling unit detached in addition to the primary dwelling, or, excuse me, you can have two additional dwelling units attached in addition to the primary dwelling. We just wanted to make it very clear and sort of remove that often open-ended question about what can I do, and here it's very straightforward. So for new and edited definitions, um, the first would be impervious. We do have a section in our general regulations bylaw that does regulate how much impervious surface you can have in your rear yard in the urban residential area. Um, we have dealt in the past, it's very common where people are uh, entirely hardscaping their rear yards, which is contributing to drainage, grading, uh, and stormwater flow issues within the residential neighborhoods. So we implemented a 50% maximum impervious. However, when we brought in the new zoning bylaw we did not define impervious and that did leave us in a position where it was again difficult for us to enforce uh, and implement this provision so we have added a definition the definition is pretty black and white but it leaves a clear direction as to yes you're allowed or no you're not and if you're not here is an opportunity to go through a process to consider these things and it just on our end and on um, the residents end removes all that time it takes to go back and forth is it is it not that kind of thing 
So the next new edited definition would be service industries. Again, this is a permitted use in our employment areas. We've had a lot of questions about this, but when we brought in our new zoning bylaw, we didn't define it. So we're just adding a definition to provide a little bit more clarity to people who want to set up this type of business. And then we can tell them with certainty, this is where you belong in our zones. The third new edited definition would be basement. Uh, so we had previously a very old definition in our older bylaw of basement, really speaking to a cellar area. Um, but currently in our new zoning bylaw, there's a lot of vague um, uh, terms around basement and how it's used. We have encountered in commercial areas where people are using the basement uh, as part of their commercial operations, so adding offices down there or completely separate businesses. In our general regulations, we do not require parking, parking for basements, so there has been a bit of um, some conflict there, making sure that we're getting the appropriate parking on site for the uses that are proposed. So what we've added here is that, of course, you can have a basement and it can be for ancillary uses and storage, and that's great and you don't need parking. But if it's going to be become a part of that primary use, it's going to be become a commercial use, then, of course, we have to look at the parking in that instance. So again, this is just cleaning up the zoning by uh, making sure that there's clarity there and removing any ambiguity. And then for our final new and edited definition, we have boarding house and rooming house. Both exist right now and are defined in our current bylaw. They both have uh, relatively outdated definitions, which again makes it difficult for us to enforce. So what we've done is we are editing the boarding house definition and removing rooming house altogether because today we talk about those two together. Um, and we're just making it very clear that it is a proprietor who's offering lodging rooms to five or more persons, which seems appropriate for the type of um, dwelling and residential setup that we have in our communities with or without meals in return for room remuneration or the provision of service or both and of course it excludes hotel bed and breakfast establishment special needs housing and this would go along hand in hand with the proposed general regulations. That's a quick overview. Of course, there's a lot more detail contained in the report that really goes through the definitions, how they all work together, and there is a red line revision so you can see exactly what's changing. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation, Madeline. Just to be clear to our members of the public, no decisions are being made tonight. Um, it's a public meeting just to get input, not to have input from the public so that when Madeline and her staff and team go back to present the final findings, they can incorporate what's being said, and then we can work that in and have deliberations. So uh, we're here tonight to listen to members of the public, and that input will be taken in by Madeline and her team, and then it will come back to a committee of the whole meeting, and then that's where council will debate it, and then make a recommendation from there, and then it would go to council. So committee to council, just to outline the process. Um, thank you for that. So is there any questions for clarification um, to Madeline? And then I'm going to go to members of the public. Uh, Councillor Masters, I'll go around the shoe if that's okay. Yes, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Through uh, to Planner Madeline. Um, everything makes perfect sense on there as far as I can see, Madeline. Uh, I do have a question, though. I have run into this when I was on the Committee of Adjustment. Um, on the accessory residential unit attachment, what do you consider an attachment? Through you, Mayor, to Councillor uh, Masters. So for attached, uh, it can be anything as long as it's within the primary dwelling. So if you have an attached garage, that could be something above that attached garage. It would be not included if it was a detached garage. And then the way that we define it to provide more flexibility is it just has to be clearly accessory to the primary dwelling. We used to have a size requirement, um, but if we're looking at these accessory dwelling units to be a way to fix some of the housing issues we're dealing with, we certainly don't want to say you must have a small unit mm -hmm. as the only permitted unit. We want to make these units viable uh, and uh, available for all types of, of families and arrangements. Uh, well, supplementary for me. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the reason I say that is because what we run into is, especially on the, uh, what we used to run into on the Committee of Adjustment, is uh, the not in my backyard issue. When somebody wants to build an accessory building, they can say, wait a minute, you know, that's going to block my eyesight here, the sight lines here, and it's going to do this, that, and the other. So if there's any issue in the clar and what they clar clearly call an accessory building, then 
that becomes an issue, right? So the one issue uh, or the one uh, situation that I ran into is that there was a long breezeway at, uh, joining the original building to the actual accessory building. That's why I brought that up, you know, so if somebody could say, well, wait a minute, it's not really attached, that's just a covered walkway, you know, so anyway. Um, uh, that's why I brought it up. I'm sure that it will be addressed, but I wanted to mention that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, going around the street, Councillor Best, please. Uh, thank you, Worship. Thank you, Worship, to, to Madeline. Um, <clears throat> I noticed, well, one of the things I just want to bring up real quick, you know, the, the first new provision, the one that addresses um, commercial parking within the agricultural zoned areas, um, I noticed in the red line update, you, you were talking about <clears throat> allowing only one commercial motor vehicle not accessory. So, um, through your worship, just th th when you're saying one commercial vehicle, so anything, th this would be something that is absolutely not related to agriculture. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor, to Councillor Biss, that's correct. Um, so, it would be anything that's not related to the permitted uses on that property. Thank you. Uh, through your worship, supplemental question. Um, and uh, with that regard, so when we're talking multi-general families that live in an agricultural zoned area, I mean, some of them, many of them uh, will um, have a, a, their source of income may be not related to the farm, but related to farming in general. In other words, they may do um, uh, auto mechanic, large machinery, uh, tow trucking, things like that. If we've got multi-generational families, they may require more than one commercial vehicle. Is it possible for us to amend this to include maybe one per generation? Through you, Mayor, to Councillor Biss, it's definitely something that we can take back. Um, we would have to give it a lot of thought on how we could actually enforce that um, and what it might mean to our bylaw department as well to prove what exactly that means. Um, but I will say that uh, if there are individuals on the property who are operating sort of like a small machine repair shop, that kind of thing, um, as an offshoot to the farm, that would still be a use we would have to consider separate to this particular provision, which is we're allowing you to have your whatever commercial motor vehicle that may be that's totally not related to any permitted use there. So we can certainly look into that as, a, as something that uh, we should consider moving forward because certainly dynamics are changing. We just need to be sure that we can enforce it. Through your worship, um, to Madeline. Um, so related to that, you know, we've got situations where they may not be operating some commercial business, but they may be working for someone related to that business. So example, so for example, you may be a bus driver that bring the, a, a bus to the to the property. You and your son may be a tow truck driver that brings a tow truck. Uh, you know, there may be all sorts of non-agriculture related, however, heavy industry um, based on their expertise. So I'd like to see this to be, you know, uh, if we can consider multi-generational, um, um, uh, the multi-generational factor of this. And the fact that also, if we're also providing accessory buildings, you may have three families living on one property. So we, need, we may need to consider that as well so that we won't be so... Uh, uh, so restrictive in terms of like the landscaping buffer, et cetera. They may want to park all their vehicles in one very large driveway. I think we need to be more uh, flexible with that. Through you, Mary. Duly noted. We'll definitely take that for consideration. Thank you, Councillor. I'm just going to come around the horseshoe this way. And Councillor Harrison McIntyre, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you. Um, thank you to my two fellow councillors. They brought up some really good points. Um, I know of an example of similar to what you said where to comply with being attached, they put down a concrete pad that attached this building to that building, and then they were able to build it as tall as they want. Um, you know, that's, I don't think that's the intention of having it attached, but that's a workaround. And um, for ourselves, when we built our accessory building, we had to go through the whole, you know, process. Um, and it looks much better than having like a, you know, a barn style thing right attached to our house. And that's what was important to us, was not, um, you know, like saving the $700 at the time, but to have something that actually worked and looked better on the property. So I, I, I don't really agree with the idea of always having the, ex the buildings have to be attached. I think that that's one way of thinking, but I don't think that it, when you have a lot of land, I don't think that it actually 
always suits the purposes of the of the property or contributes to the general overall aesthetic of the property. Um, and then to Councillor Biss's point, <clears throat> when we had our septic system put in, when we wanted to have our driveway plowed, we would call up our farmer who's a neighbor, uh, our neighbor, and he would come down with his backhoe and clean our driveway and put in our septic system. But if you put these rules in place, that kind of business will no longer be um, able to operate. Meanwhile, who's going to do that kind of work around here? We're going to have to call somebody from, you know, far away to do the work. How does that help our community? How does that, I mean, he's not doing it anymore, but, you know, how, how would it, how would it necessarily contribute to the local small businesses who, who are able to operate because they can just drive their backhoe down the road and do people septic? So again, I think that there's a, there needs to be some consideration for um, supporting um, on-farm diversification, which is what we're, you know, which is, you know, maybe not the exact definition, but it, it does help these farmers to be viable farmers. Um, uh, this is a question, the Oak Ridges, um, the Oak Ridges having an attached accessory building, do, will they still, I, I think I heard you say that they still have to go through the entire EA process and, or they won't have to? Through you, Mary, they will have to submit an EIS, which is environmental impact statement, yes. to demonstrate there's no negative impacts to the, the future. So, um, so there are, would they be allowed, so it's, you said, you stated that they were allowed to have an attached accessory building, is that right? Or attached additional residential, is that what it was? I'm, I'm sorry, I, my notes are pretty terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Through you, Mayor, that's no problem. Um, so it's just a single detached dwelling that's going to be permitted. Single detached dwelling yeah. is allowed to, like, so an existing. So where they have a property right now that doesn't have any built form okay. on it, um, we are not able to just, sort of blanket remove those property rights. So we are giving an avenue to allow them to build that single detached dwelling if it was permitted in the zoning bylaw previously um, without impacting the, the feature, but that would be the only thing. So accessory okay. buildings are still not permitted. Okay. Again, that goes back to my, my other point, which is, you know, if you have a property that is, um, you know, 10 acres plus, and you want to have a detached garage because you don't want to have an attached garage for whatever reason, because of the shape of your lot, because of aesthetics, whatever. Um, I don't know that, it, you know, like the negative impact of having it attached versus not attached, if the size is the same, is, is going to be any, any more impactful. So I, I, I have a little bit of issue with that. Um, So with the basement, when you're talking about businesses that are having another, is it another business or they're expanding into their basement? Through you, Mayor, to Councillor Harrison McIntyre, it would be an expansion of that primary use. So um, right now, how our zoning bylaw is set up is the parking requirements are based on the gross floor area of the primary use. Um, but then we had a caveat that if it's for a basement, because typically basements are used for ancillary storage or whatnot, you wouldn't need to provide any parking. But we do have businesses who are looking to fully fit out basements, is either establishing brand new commercial uses or creating more offices, obviously generating more employees. Um, so we think that adding this provision will help us better regulate and make sure that we are getting enough parking on the lot. Okay. Um, and then I was just going to make a suggestion for the, um, with the impervious um, pavement, that there be some suggestion on how to introduce or have um, LID or pervious pavement options and, you know, what can you do if you wanted to put down stone or whatever and, and still be able to meet your 50%. Mm -hmm because there's a lot of there's a lot of options that way now mm -hmm. that's it thank yes. you <laughs> thank you councillor uh councillor mccallan then we'll go oh, sorry deputy mayor mccallan then we'll go to the public for your comments please thank you mayor norcross so I, I i'd like to ask about the um additional residential parking 
of commercial vehicles. Um, so the first change we're making is said owner and operator of the vehicle is the primary resident. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering is if we can be even more specific, like you have companies, like I think maybe these gentlemen are from, that the owner operator has a fleet and his employees drive these fleets. And sometimes they drive quite far away from their, um, their actual bricks and mortar business. And it would add hours to their day to go back to that business, drop the car off, or the, the commercial vehicle off, pick up their own car, and then go back home. So I'm wondering if, if, if we can add something like, as long as um, these, it, they're employees of the business, and that they're insured to drive that vehicle through the business, would it not be okay if we allowed them to bring their, their commercial vehicles home? provided that, and I don't know if it's <clears throat> like when bylaw gets the complaint, they say, no, no, you know, we, we know that these are all the people in New Tecumseh that work for this company that are insured to drive these vehicles that are allowed to bring them home. I just, it, it would be very hard to have a business that has a fleet of commercial vehicles, provided they, they stay within the side, all the rest of, of, the, of the requirements, but not everybody is going to be the, the actual owner of the vehicle but mostly everybody is going to work for the company who owns the vehicle and are insured through that company. So a, a, a little bit more leniency on that, I think, would go a long way for some of our local businesses. Thank you. Through you, Mayor, to Deputy Mayor. Yes, yeah, so we could consider, um, I'll take it back and chat with my colleagues, but it could be like an and or situation. So it would be said owner and or operator of the vehicle as a, as a primary resident of that home. So we could consider something like that. Thank you. No, thank you. And I'll just wrap up for the public because I know we do have some businesses in the town that are on a 24 seven on call basis. And most of the time it's an emergency <laughs> you, and you have to get there. So time is of the essence. So I think consideration should be, or could you please look at consideration for those type of businesses that are 24 seven and are and on call and they have time sensitivity that they have to respond to. Well, thank you, council, uh, planning public meeting. So we you have two choices. You can either address us from the podium uh, if you wanna make any comments or you can send us an email or send your written um, correspondence in. If you wanna be involved further, um, please give your name, phone number and email to uh, our deputy clerk. So I'll just open it up to the members of the audience. Would you like to come up to the podium, sir, and, and please give your name? Hi, how are you? My name is Jameson Johnson. I own JJ Tony and Covery. Um, I've lived here since I was three. I've been in business here since I was 16. I'm coming on 30 years this August. Uh, I've always lived in town. I've lived on Hutchison Drive. I've lived on Stewart. I've lived on Donor. I've I uh, lived on Lawrence Street at the apartment building that unfortunately burned down a few years ago by, beside the high school. Um, I've never had an issue with all our trucks. Um, our business is growing. Um, uh, new regulations came out uh, last year and this year that put a lot of businesses that weren't on the up and up out of business, um, that didn't want to pull the weight that the MTO was requiring us to do. We did. Uh, we have succeeded. We've gone from three trucks last year to almost 10 trucks this year. My main business was based out of Essa. That's where, that's where my house is, is in Essa. Uh, I've loved to have lived in Alston, but I just couldn't afford it when I bought a house. Um, long story short, um, I have four drivers that live primary in Alston. Um, they, they're renters, they don't own their houses, they rent basement apartments, or they rent, you know, live with their parents or whatnot. Um, and we've had a complaint came in about one of our trucks um, leaving at, at all hours of the night and the backup beeper was quite loud. It's an MTO regulation, we have to have them unfortunately. What we have done to appease the neighborhood that that gentleman lives in is we put that backup beeper on a toggle switch. So when he's on his way home, he pulls over, he flicks the switch, when the truck goes into reverse, the beeper doesn't come on. When he starts his next morning shift, he flicks the switch, the beeper works and activate it again. So if we get pulled over by MTO or your bylaw enforcement officers, the truck's working as it needs to as per the bylaw and the MTO regulations. Since then, I don't think we've had an issue. I haven't heard a complaint. I don't know if there has been one brought in by the town, so I'm hoping that was the main concern. 
but what the complaint came in brought in um, there's a problem we have to try to figure this out so our trucks are 3500 GM trucks or Ford chassis or F-350s which is a standard pickup truck that anybody can go to a dealership and buy there's nothing different about it and in fact they're actually when they're turned into tow trucks the frames are cut at the back six inches so they're shorter for the record to work to be bolted on so we took a measurement today of my pickup truck I just bought it's an 18 2018 uh, Chev 3500 four-door dually pickup truck and I bought it for camping snowmobiling and as a spare tow truck it has an underlift on it it's not a conventional style tow truck with the record body from the front bumper to the edge of the wheel lift is 21 feet that's a standard pickup truck the tow trucks from the front bumper to the back of the record body is 18 feet so if you put the regulations at 19 feet my personal pickup truck I can't have in my house if I live in Alston but my tow truck I can't so that there's a there's a it's it's a hard it's a very gray area and I get it nobody wants to deal with tow trucks nobody wants to deal with beepers nobody wants their they're loud they're they're oversizing vehicles um, there's new regulations coming in in July um, with the Ministry of Transportation regarding tow trucks they're trying to force us out of having 3500 Class C chassis of trucks so Ford F-350s Dodge 3500s GM 3500s they want to obsolete those as one ton tow trucks and force us as an industry to go to 4500s and 450s and Dodge 4500s and 5500s if you go to try to buy a brand new tow truck today at the price of astonishingly $227,000 you can't buy a 3500 truck they refuse to build them because they don't know if this law is going to come into effect July 1st so if that law comes into effect I have to replace all these trucks when the lease runs out because they're going to grandfather them in under the lease but then I have to tell drivers like this gentleman here my other two and the other three drivers in town that either you're gonna to have to buy a car I'm gonna to have to find a commercial property that is zoned for a tow truck company that's going to use it as a storage lot which there's, I think, one left in town that just got sold to a construction company, which was Early's Auto Parts. There's nowhere to put. There's nowhere to put the trucks. I've looked. We're a 24-hour basis period. Um, we are prominently the only company left in Alston area that's, that that works in Alston right now. Um, that's approved by the OPP, the TSSO program, and is licensed under the tri municipalities. Our licenses are all out of ESSA because our pound is in ESSA because the, all the pounds here were occupied. Um, I have asked the bylaw when we had our meeting about the parking. When I was putting three other trucks on the road, my pound is in ESSA because of it's a tri municipality. Can I license those three trucks under Alliston? But it would have caused more of a guideline because of the cross townships so that's why my trucks aren't licensed in new tech I would love to support the town we do work for the town um, but we are 24 hours so if <clears throat> I have a driver that's sitting at home at midnight and there's a crash at Honda I have 30 minutes to get there by the OPP request so if the trucks are at my home base in Angus or Baxter he's not gonna be able to drive his car to my house pick up a truck and go all the way back in 30 minutes so that's gonna cause a problem for business wise which is why they bring the trucks home so we can offer that now it's not every day that we're in and out all hours of the night winter time they barely go home I, I work my guys pretty hard they work 12 hour shifts and they work on call on weekends and that's why I let them take the trucks home if I can't let them take the trucks home I'm gonna have to force them to buy cars a lot of them can't afford a car I mean it's you know it, it, this industry uh, is very busy and prominent and I need them when they when they need to be there so that's why they have to bring their trucks home I don't know how to fix it um, weight wise if you put a weight classification on it um, an average driver with a G driver's license which everybody probably in this room has at the bare minimum is a G driver's license it classifies you to to drive anything with a combined weight of 11,000 kg which is 22,000 and change pounds so any one of you can pick up a vehicle and drive it home to your house that's classified to weight of 22,000 pounds whether it be a pickup truck, a car, a minivan, whatever. But you can't if you put a weight class on it. If you buy a one-ton pickup truck to pull your camper trailer, you're not going to be able to bring that home. It's too long, it's too heavy. Farmers that, you know, have a farm that drive their, you know, Ford Platinum F-350 Dooley's as a farm truck home to their house in Alliston won't be able to bring their trucks home because they're too big. 
They're too heavy. They're too wide. They're too long. So what do we do? How do we fix it? No, thank you for those comments. And Madeline, you'll take note of all that. And uh, JJ, you. if you give us uh, your name and number, we'll, just, we'll make yeah, sure, she, and she email. Has, yeah, she has all that. Okay, yeah. and we'll keep you updated as we go yeah. through the process. So uh, I, Even I suggested last time was maybe if it if it's not, I could see like a, you don't want a, a transport truck, tow truck in someone's driveway. I, I understand that. But even if there's a, a fee to park a commercial vehicle, so it's something commuting to the town to have a fee of a, you know, an oversight commercial vehicle to a certain extent. I mean, I'd be willing to even do that, to propose that. Alrighty. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much for those comments. They're greatly appreciated. Thank you, Madeline. So, um, JJ's made a request for further no notice of council's decision, which we'll make sure that he gets. So, any person requesting further notice of the decision taken on this matter or further notice of future meetings on this matter must notify the planning department in writing. So, we have a recommendation that report number PD 2023 23 be received. And for the presentation of Madeline Gibson, senior planner be received and further that staff consider all comments and concerns pertaining to the proposed amendments prior to submitting a recommendation report and by the committee of the whole i move by councillor biss and second by the deputy mayor all those in favor and before i call adjournment madeline what type of time frame are we are you expecting just two months three months six months um, a year through you, Mary. Initially, we were hoping to uh, take it to Committee of Whole in July, but okay. um, just based on some of the feedback, obviously, we're going to have to look back and, and take some consideration of the comments and concerns we heard. So we'll still shoot for that timeline, but it might be a little bit Might longer. be the fall? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I have a recommendation that the meeting adjourn at... Okay, so moved by Councillor Masters, seconded by Councillor Cabrick, then for giving me the time, and we're adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.